All right. Okay, we thank the Most High for another Sabbath. Um, we wanted to go into a few things. I know I said we would hit Corinthians, the third chapter. So we're going to hit that first. Okay. And we're going into this uh, based on how uh, uh, there are certain scriptures the Christian church used to say that the law is done away with. And we want to give clarity by reading the precepts and examine them to see if what the Christians are saying is true according to the scriptures they use. The other thing I wanted to get into, uh, if, if, time, if, if there's time allotted, is the, uh, the UFO activity all throughout the world. And what is it? Is it from the Most High? Or is it from the other side? Is it a little bit of each? I want to be able to go into that through the spirit of the Most High on the Sabbath. And um, after that, we can open up questions. All right? We apologize. The chat is, um, the chat is closed. But sometimes the, 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 the chat is a, dash, a distraction mm -hmm. from the lesson itself. And brothers and sisters sometimes want to say the first thing that comes to their mind. Not that it's right or wrong, it's just not timely based on the lessons we are, we are putting forth. So we let, give us an opportunity to bring forth what the Most High allow us to, and then if you have any questions on that or have any other things you'd have to say afterwards, we'll open it for that. But first, let's go to Corinthians. We're in the Holy Bible, the King James Version Bible, and we're going here. I'm going to try to attack both of those things today. Corinthians 3 and also 2 Corinthians 3 and also if time is allotted what's going on with all these this space activity or what you would call UFO activity. All right? Now let's go to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. You can follow us in the King James Version Bible. This is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. Read. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 1. Do we, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of condemnation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye have manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living power, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So I'm pulling this out because Christians use this scripture to say that the law is done away with. That it says here, for as much are you have manifest in the third verse, manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, epistles are letters. These were the letters uh, that were sent to the leaders of each church. It says, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So they use this to say that they're dealing with the spirit opposed to the ink of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. This is one of the scriptures they use. I'm going to go further to show you how they error in their understanding. They'll say, well, brother, it's not with ink, but it's with, it's with the spirit, the heart. And, I'm, and I said, well, okay. If that's the case, did Paul use ink to write this official right here? How are we reading this epistle without ink? So you must have some understanding. That's why it says, with all thy getting, get understanding. It's not saying to ignore the laws that was written in the Old Testament. And we're going to clear it up. It's not saying ignore, ignore what's being written in ink and just go after the heart. That's what they proclaim. Paul clears it up through the scriptures. Listen to this clearly. Read. Verse 4. 
And such trust we have we through Christ to the Most High One. Okay. Verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficient, sufficiency is of the Most High. Read. Verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And it says, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Why? For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now the example of that is, we said it once before, under the Old Testament, with breaking the law came penalties of death. So what was supposed to be life to the children of Israel meant their demise. What Paul is dealing with here is you have converts from the pharisaical uh, uh, factions and from the Sanhedrin and those that were under the old covenant, they're newly converts. This new teaching of Christ is, is fresh to them. So they still have the condemnation and the killing of people in their heart based on how they were raised under the old covenant. So now Paul is saying, listen, that letter kill them. You're not coming into our church killing people. That was the pretext. See, church don't, churches don't go back and understand why Paul was writing these letters to these particular churches. If you have a convert that believe that it's okay to kill people, you probably just killed someone last week for adultery, murder, or whatever. And now you come into a church that's dealing with grace in the spirit of Christ. These people have to be retaught back then. This teaching that this teaching of the new covenant was fresh. So he had to let these people who were live, learning under the, the Sanhedrin, learning under the Pharisees, he had to let them know, listen, we're not killing people in this church. We will give people the opportunity to repent and to get it right because Christ went to the cross so that we could have life he's not telling these people in the church forget Moses altogether and forget the Old Testament he says that he's a minister of the New Testament hold that and let's get the precepts for minister of the New Testament get Job 31 and Hebrews 8 Job 31 and Hebrews 8. We're going to read Je uh, Jeremiah 31 down to 35. Let's start at Job 31, I mean Jeremiah 31 and 31 down to 35. Then we're going straight to 2 Corinthians. And see, this is what you have to do with these Christians when they go here because they're not going to, they don't want to use the precepts to get understanding. Right there, when they hear that spirit and that in the heart, right there, that's a mind control mechanism that makes them start going off and screaming and saying, see, it's about the heart. Jesus and the spirit then they, they then they go there so you have to calm them down and say listen I'm with you but let's go to the precepts to get this understanding here yeah it's not about the flesh that's correct it's about the spirit yes it's not about the letter that kill us but the letter but the letter that have life when when Moses said do not murder when the most gave him that commandment was that for life or was that for death so we're not going to ignore all of Moses' commandments, okay? That's what the pagans want us to do. Let's get the precepts. Jeremiah 31 and 31, read. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Most High, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. A new covenant is an agreement. That's the same as a testament, okay? The old covenant was the Old Testament. So when you get past Malachi, 
you see the words on, in your Bible says New Testament. You got the New Covenant now. So this New Covenant is also written in the Old Covenant. Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. The days come up, saith the Lord, that he will make a new covenant. Now, now, Paul and the disciples were the ministers of this new covenant. Read. With who? With the house of Israel. So you think uh, Paul didn't know the covenant in which he was ministering about? He was the minister of the new covenant. So when they go here in Corinthians, you take them back to Jeremiah 31 and say, well, let's see what Paul was, was a minister about. How, what was he ministering to? He was ministering knowing that he was a minister of the New Testament. So you must go into the Old Testament to bring the understanding of what he was ministering about. A new covenant with who? With the house of Israel. With the house of Israel. Paul understood this. This is the new covenant, brothers and sisters. Read. And with the house of Judah. He says the house of Israel and house of Judah because the kingdom was split in 721 B.C. Israel represents the ten tribes of the northern kingdom and Judah represents the three tribes, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, who were under the southern kingdom. Read. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Which the covenant they break. So it's not going to be according to the law that, that when we came through the Red Sea. We broke that covenant. That's what he told Jeremiah. Now listen to this clearly. So Paul is a minister of the new covenant. Let's see what this new covenant is to Israel. Read. Although I was in husband unto them. He was a husband to us. Said the Most High. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Go ahead. After those days, saith the Most High, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will put my law in their what? In their inward parts. In their inward parts, read. And write them, and write it in their hearts. Hold, let's stop for a second and go back to second. Hold up, I'll read it. You stay in Jeremiah. I think we're getting some understanding on this heart now. When you read Second Corinthians 3, and it talks about the heart, it says, let me get it here clearly. For as much, 2 Corinthians 3 and 3, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, in the tables of stone, not, not in tables of stone, excuse me, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. So what this is saying is that he would put the law in our heart so that we couldn't forget it, opposed to it being in stone. Nonetheless, it's still the same law. It's not a different law. We broke the law because it was what you would call on fleshly tables and we didn't apply them within ourselves. So there will be a, mac a mechanism set forth through Christ that would allow us through the Holy Spirit to get it in us, opposed to one man delivering something to us, and one priesthood which we would have to, like the, the Levitical priesthood, that we would have to be subject under. We would have it in our minds. So it's less excuse to break the law if you understand what Paul is reading here. He was telling the Pharisees and scribes and those students in the classes under the Pharisees and scribes, listen, our people must learn to get it right. We are killing these people before they have the opportunity to receive the spirit and understand their error. See, Christ gave us that grace to obtain the law, to get better with the law not to break it on purpose. This is what you have to show. But there's something key here. Go back to Jeremiah 31. What verse you left off? Uh, verse 33. Read it. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. With who? With the house of Israel. With what? With the house of Israel. With the house of Israel. The new covenant was an agreement with God 
and the Israelites. Because these are the people who broke the old covenant. This agreement is not with all nations, but all nations can partake if they follow. If they follow the true God of Israel, they can partake. But in particular, the Most High is speaking to the same people who walked through the Red Sea. I'm reading about the new covenant right here in Jeremiah 31. And at this time, Gentiles were not considered part of the covenant at all. Yes. You was told the new covenant was for Christians. Yeah. Who told you that? Christians. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, hey, I'm, if they can give me the scripture, you know, I'm, I'm with it. But all in all, the new covenant is for the children of Israel. And this is the covenant that the new world order and the powers that be are trying to keep from the children of Israel. That agreement starting with the covenant made with Abraham. They're trying to take this from God's people. Now let me show you more before I go back to Corinthians. Read. After those days, saith the Most High, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Write it in their hearts. Therefore, it will not be fleshly tables of stone anymore. But they would still know to follow the law through the Spirit of Christ. They would follow the Most High and follow his law because they love him. That was the reason he gave it on stone from the beginning, not for them to start killing each other. So obviously it wasn't complete. I think this is clearing up for a lot of people now, even Christians. How can the Most High make a law and put so much work in it and then come and bring his son and say, well, don't, well forget about it. It doesn't matter anymore. Do what you want to do and I'll accept you. Even though if you do bad, you're going to hell. So that'll, that'll confuse a believer. Okay, I can do what I want to do. But if I'm bad, I go to hell. Well, what's bad? I have grace. There should be no such thing as bad. What is bad if I have grace? If I can break all of God's law and still make it into the kingdom of heaven, what are we talking about hell for? So the Jehovah Witnesses came up and said, you know what? <laughs> there is no hell then. Do what you want to do. You'll just be asleep forever. There's no hell. There's no judgment. That sounds like a satanic doctrine to me. There's no accountability. If you can just excuse the law of the Most High. So my, que my question to Christians is, well, what law do we follow? you saying the law was placed in your heart that Christ gave you. What is this law? What is it? They'll say, well, it's the nine, it's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments? Well, why are you worshiping on Sunday? You're breaking one of the ten. So when you ask them these common sense questions, they, it confuses them. Because if the law is done away with, then okay. There is no law. But there's something key here. Listen to Jeremiah 31. Read. I will put my law in their inward parts. In their inward parts, in their minds. And write it in their hearts. Go ahead. And will be their power, and they shall be my people. Now, that means the children of Israel will be God's people again. Why? Because the Most High was wrath with the children of Israel and cut them off like a divorce. So again, these people, the same people he spoke about in the old covenant, will be his people in the new covenant, according to the Bible. Read. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Most High, for they shall all know me, from the least of, of them unto the greatest of them. So it's going to come a time where they will need no teachers, that we will grow all as a nation with the understanding of who we are. You're not going to have people trying to teach you, what? listen, you're not African, you're not Puerto Rican, you're not this, you're not that. The Holy Spirit soon is going to be on our people. And we'll all know who we are without teachers. And when Christ comes, he's going to fill in the rest.
So there'll be no need for people to go out and teach about these things anymore. That's the ultimate prize. We'll be at rest, we'll be at peace. So this is the covenant, and no one is talking about this covenant in the Christian churches. Read. Uh, verse 34. Read it. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Most High, for they shall all know me. We will all know the Most High. Now, that's a, that's a miracle in itself based on the destruction and, and what have happened to us all over this earth, us not understanding anything. That's a miracle in itself. All of God's people, all the children of Israel will know who they are and they will know the Most High. And they will never break his law again. This is the question I be having, uh, I used to pose to Christians sometimes. In the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, or while we're in the presence of Christ and the Most High, will we, will we be eating pork? Now I'll use that on a small level. Will we be eating pork? And they'll look at you and say, well, no. But right now we're under grace. So why under grace are you doing things that you know the Most High will not accept in the kingdom? I thought grace was an opportunity to know what's right or wrong and to get it right before we're in the kingdom. For if we rehearse the righteous acts, we'll be ready when Christ returns. So you mean to tell me you're going to break the law on purpose? Until Christ returns? Listen to this clearly. Read. Now, I need you to read a little. Where you at? Keep on going. Keep on going. Read. I know the most high, for they shall all know me, from the, from the least of them unto the greatest of them. Keep on going. Saith the most high, for I will forgive their iniquity. He will forgive the children of Israel's iniquity. So they're not teaching us this in the church. They're telling us the new covenant is that Israel is done away with. And he accepts every other people except his. But the fulfillment of that new testament, which Paul is a minister of, tells us that the Most High will forgive his people and take them back. And marry them again. So they're not even teaching the new covenant and salvation in the churches. They're not teaching it. Read. And I will remember their sin no more. And the Most High will remember the children of Israel's sin no more. Read. Verse 35. Thus saith the Most High. Thus saith who? Thus saith the Most High. The Most High Ahiah. Go ahead. Which giveth the sun for a light by day. The sun by light by day. And the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for light. By night. They all are in total union with the Most High and deal with on his command to minister to us within the earth. Read. Which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. Because the moon controls the waves of the sea and the tides of the sea. Read. The Most High of hosts is his name. The Most High of hosts. That means he's the Most High, the power of all angels. The hosts are his heavenly angels. Read. Verse 36. If those ordinances depart from before me. That means if there's no more moon and there's no more sun and there's no more stars. The Most High says if you wake up and those things have departed from him. Read. Saith the Most High. Then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Then Israel will be done away with. What do that prove? That's proof that Israel, God's people, are here, and they will never die. That's what that proves. So this is the new covenant we're talking about, the new agreement. The Most High made an oath and say, listen, as long as you can see that sun when you wake up, and that moon at night before you go to sleep, know that I will never cast my people away. So what are the Christians talking about that he done away with his people to get a new people? How can the Most High love other nations more than his own? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, common sense wouldn't even bring you into those understandings. 
If someone have children which came from their own loins and they adopted a child, they can give that adopted child much love. But in reality, they would never love that adopted child like the children that came from them. That's, that's common sense. Okay, but they'll tell you that the Most High have accepted all the adopted children and have just cast his people away like they are nothing. And see, that's the psychological understanding of those who are controlling the earth. They want us to believe that, that way, that God's people are less important compared to everyone else in the earth. So someone have to stand and say, well, listen, this is, this is not right. Let's talk about this New Testament that Paul was bringing forth. And let's give the, the correct interpretation of the New Covenant. Not to say break the law, but let's start teaching brothers and sisters to get that law we broke and receive it through Christ and have it in our hearts and minds to practice it today. All right, that's what it's talking about. And not judging people and killing people based on the fact that they, they are struggling with things and not to kill and destroy them. Give them an opportunity to get it in their heart. And see, and that's what Paul was trying to tell the Pharisees, the scribes, the, Nicolai, the, the Nicolaitans, and all these other Old Testament factions who wanted to come into the church and immediately judge brothers and sisters. Read. Verse 37. Thus saith the Most High, if heaven above can be measured. If heaven above can be measured. That means, can you measure heaven above? You can't, right? But that's not stopping Satan and his cohorts from trying. They use the Hubble telescope. Okay, and they're using all types of technology out in space to try to measure space. Why? They know these scriptures. If they can measure space, read. And the foundations of the earth search out beneath. If they can go into the depths of the earth and measure exactly how great the depths are in the earth. Read. I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done. See that? The Most High. That's why they do it. They know the Most High is bound by their word, his word. So that's why they're out in space, because the Most High gave them a challenge. If you can measure space, and if you can measure the earth beneath, then I'll cast my people off. I used to wonder why these people were all up under the earth risking their life for what? They know the oath here. They want us cast off. They want us destroyed. See, but the most I have Leviathan in the deep. So they can't measure the deep. There's a monster that goes throughout the whole earth underwater. Through the pressure in Leviathan, we don't have to worry about them measuring the depths of the sea. Okay? Read. So the Most High will never cast away his people. And see, we're teaching salvation. Some people say, well, why do you focus on Israel? Why? Because they are counted for the elect. And these are the people that will stand and help save the rest of the world, including the Gentiles. Including the Gentiles that follow Christ. The meek and the poor. It tell you, Christ tell you, the meek shall inherit the earth. So these people whom society look at as nothing, degenerates, uh, of no value, the Most High hold them to high esteem and will use them. So it's, that's why we talk salvation and the understanding of the new covenant that's raising the children of Israel, that's bringing them to their understanding to have this law in their heart because in, in that law comes power. Comes power, okay? That means putting off shrimp, crab, lobster, all uh, moral, civil, dietary, sin. All those things have to be put away. And that empowers us and connects us to our God, the God that delivered us from the hands of the Egyptians. 
okay? Now, Zeus and the other gods you worship, and you can do what you want to do, and you will actually be blessed. So some people ask, well, in a church, it seems that I'm blessed. Yeah, you're blessed, because your god, which is Zeus or someone else, is giving you the spoils of the earth. Right now, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. So they do have money to give you. So Zeus can bless you too. Go back to Corinthians. Three and four. Second Corinthians three and four. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter three, verse four. Read it. And such trust have we through Christ to God with. Go ahead. Now that we are sufficient of our not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficient sufficiency is of the most high who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. The New Testament, he will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and that links directly to Hebrews 8 and 8. So if you want to read it, you can read not only that in the Old Testament, because there's Christians that say, well, listen, Jeremiah was the Old Testament. Okay, you got me there. Hold that and get Hebrews 8 and 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Read it. For finding fault with them. For finding fault with them. Who did the Most High find fault, find fault with? The children of Israel who broke his commandments. Read. He said. He said. Behold, the days come, saith the Most High, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. With who? With the house of Israel. And with who? And with the house of Judah. So in Hebrews, it's quoting Jeremiah 31 and 31. So yes. That covenant didn't change from Jeremiah to, the, to Hebrews. It's the same covenant. It's just that they're not reading about this covenant in your churches. Or they'll read it and say, yeah, it's talking about the spiritual Israelites now. Well, I need that scripture also. And it, it's like Israel can't have nothing these days. Okay? It's like... You see a Chinese person sitting there saying, you know what, I like their culture, I like what they're about. You know what, I'm going to be a spiritual Chinese person. I feel like being a spiritual Japanese today. It, how can you be a spiritual people and, now, and become a different race? It doesn't make any sense, but they teach this in the churches. Well, we know that all the covenant are with Israel, so... To circumvent the fact that he's talking about his people, they say, well, I, we got the answer. Let's just call them spiritual Israelites. Because we can't get over all these scriptures that's talking about Israel. So, you know, I'm not who I was born. I'm a spiritual Israelite now. But Hebrews make it clear. Read that again. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Read it. For finding fault with them. He didn't find fault with all people. He found fault with his people, Israel. Read. He said. He said. Behold, the days come, saith the Most High, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. With who? With the house of Israel. With the spiritual Israelites. With the house of Israel. With the house of Israel. Why did he say the house of Israel? Because these were the people who broke the old covenant. So how can these be spiritual Israelites when he found fault with not the Gentiles, but the Israelites in the Old Covenant? Read. And with the house of Judah. So the whole house will get grace and receive grace to come back to the Most High. Because God's people broke the law, all the nations and the Gentiles have power over them and have been destroying them in the earth up until this day. What was George Washington from America? He was a spiritual Israelite. What about Benjamin Franklin? Is that another spiritual Israelite? These were the people that rolled out the Roman Catholic Darba in the, in, in the Roman conquest to take down America. The spiritual Israelites, right? Finish reading Hebrews 8 and 8. Uh, verse 9. Go ahead. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, and the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Go ahead. Because they continued not in my covenant. Because they continued not in the Most High's covenant, he had to make a new covenant with these people. Read. And I regarded them not. He regarded them not. So he cast them away 
And like Jeremiah 17 says, these people forgot their heritage. They lost their heritage. They were outcasts. They were like children without any understanding of their foreparents. They were castaways. Now I'm starting, I'm beginning to understand the reason for Christ and the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit would need to revive these people in the last days to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay? Read. Saith the Most High, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. With who? With the house of Israel. Spiritual Israelites. With the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Most High. This is the new covenant. Read. I will put my laws in their mind. I will put my laws in their mind. And write them in their, in their hearts. And write them in their heart. Read. And I will be to them a power, and they shall be to me a people. He says, I'm going to be their God again, and they will be my people again. They will be my people. We know that there's been orchestrated attacks on these people. I, I, you know what? Maybe, maybe it wasn't orchestrated. Maybe everything is just by chance. Maybe it's just a coincidence that uh, crack and all the other drugs are aimed towards these people. Low education and vaccination. Maybe, you know, these things are just by chance. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence that Africa just can't get up and sustain themselves, even though their resources is more than any other place on earth. Maybe these things are just by chance that these people are suffering all over the place where they are the majority of a population like in South America, but yet the European powers control them. Maybe these things are just a coincidence. Who knows? Maybe it's a coincidence that some of the greatest people that have ever worked on earth that have built everything you see are now getting subsidies and welfare and have nothing in this earth. Maybe these, these things are not orchestrated. It's just all these things are just a coincidence. So if the Holy Spirit didn't revive them, you think the nations who have took it, taken their identity will actually give that back to them? No. It don't work that way. There's nothing by chance. There's no coincidences. So the Most High had to have a mechanism put in place in which the Holy Spirit could give this back to these people, knowing that the Gentiles who are ruling will never tell these people who they are, will never let them know about the new covenant. And a matter of fact, they'll tell them the new covenant is to continue to break God's law. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Read it. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. Go ahead. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So the, he's dealing with the spirit of the law. Because when the Most High gave us the law, it wasn't initially to kill people. If you follow the commandments the Most High gave you, believe it or not, you'll live. But the way we were using the Old Testament, it became death unto us. You see all those 613 semi laws in the Old Testament. The majority of those laws are because we break the ten. <laughs> you understand? Like if you steal from someone, there's about five or ten laws based on how to make that right. If you do certain things against a person, there's certain laws extra laws put in the commandments on how to uh, uh, reconcile your brother. Or there's laws con uh, for the priest. How will they reside over the matter? So all these laws come from one law. If you didn't steal, you wouldn't have all these laws. If you, if you didn't break all the Ten Commandments, all these other laws wouldn't be in place. So you don't null, make, make the Ten Commandments null and void. You have diet, you have dietary law, that means what to eat, to live. You have civil law. You have civil law, which is how to deal with each other. Uh, uh, just say if, if you stole from someone, how much you would need to pay back in return for you stealing from someone. That's a civil law. You had civil rights. Then you have a moral law. The moral things, like you can't run around with sheep and dogs and do certain things with bestiology and homosexuality. You had morality laws. 
You understand? So these things were the spirit of life so that we could live. Understand that. We have moral, civil, and dietary laws. And I'm going to tell you this, and I like to inject this all the time because I know other people happen on these videos. Do you know getting these foreign shots, I like to always put that out there, these foreign shots in your, in your doctor offices and all that is against the law? Did you, you know it's against God's law? And the preachers need to be teaching this. If the Most High says that you're not in Leviticus 11, I'm putting the script out so everyone can see it, that you're not supposed to eat pork, or you're not even supposed to touch its flesh, how can now you can go, go to your doctor offices and get swine flu, a shot of swine flu, with pig augmentations and pieces of pig and live organisms of pig within the actual vaccination. And when you study these vaccinations, there's live organi organisms of animals. Monkey, you got monkey pus, you have, these are all things in vaccinations now. It's, it's like they systematically say for the people who are trying to follow God's law, we're still going to push unlawful things in them and administer, and, and administer it through the health care system. Okay? And minister it through the health care system. You're not supposed to have all, none of those things. The only thing we're supposed to consume, brothers and sisters, in our mouths, in our bodies, is clean food. That's it. Clean water, clean food, clean vegetables, and if we do eat animals sometimes, clean animals according to the Leviticus 11 chapter. Then you'll live long. Vaccinations are against the law of God. Okay? I just wanted to put, I just had to interject that. Read. Uh, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So what Paul is saying here is that the New Testament and gaining the law in our heart is more glory than the glorious times of Moses. There was much glory in Moses' law. But how much more should we obtain and hold to the glory that Christ has given us with the new covenant? That's what he's saying. What he's saying is the old covenant was not complete. The new covenant is a greater covenant. Why? Because if it's in your heart, you'll never lose it. So that's a greater covenant. He's not playing one against the other. He was just showing that the old covenant was incomplete. Christ finished it. Not to look at the Old Testament and say, you know what? I'm not going to read anything Malachi and back to Genesis. It doesn't matter. That's ignorant. Okay? That's ignorant. You can't just annul or disannul the Old Testament. Read. Uh, verse 9. And I'm going to say this. For the Pharisees and the Pharisaical doctrines out there who want to reject Christ and Paul. They're doing what, Christ, what the Christians are doing but on the other side. You have the Christians rejecting Christ by breaking God's law and purpose. And you have the pharisaical Jews or Israelites that follow the Old Testament that's breaking Christ's law by not following Christ altogether. But they all on they, they're both are on each side of the spectrum of the same platform so to speak. They're all together. They're still rejecting Christ. Christ says in Matthew 5 and 17 for those that are fairly new think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. Don't ever, Christ is telling you, don't ever use my name in saying that God's law is done away with. Don't even put it in your mind. I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill the law. Read. Verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doeth the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. Read. 
For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that, that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious. So if that which was done away is glorious, it's talking about Moses' law. Okay? How was that done away? It was done away so that Christ can bring the spirit of it. Now, it's not to say now, well, okay, we can't follow the commandments. But now we have a glorious law in which judgment is not placed upon you immediately. You have an opportunity, even if you fall, to come back to the Most High and be married to him. When that opportunity was not afforded, we wasn't afforded that opportunity in the Old Testament. You did something wrong, you were dead. The letter killeth. Even if you was genuinely sorry, doesn't matter, brother. We're going to stone you. Doesn't matter. It's the law. Sorry. You die. So you, you don't have an opportunity to show if you've learned anything. Okay, so even though Moses' law was glorious, Christ's law was even more glorious because it gave Israel a chance to come back to the Father. And if you were fallen or had weaknesses, you had an opportunity to, through grace, to get things corrected. Read. Uh, verse 11. Excuse me, verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. Go ahead. For that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Go ahead. And that which remain is glorious. Talking about Christ's law. Read. Verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, the, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. It says, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So Christians will see these words abolished. See, the law is abolished. But let's see what was abolished. Hold that. And get Colossians, the second chapter. Hold your place on 13. Because we're going back, right back there. Colossians 2. Let's get it. Stick with me, eh? Let's see what was abolished. We're at 2. Colossians 2 and 14. Read it. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Hold up. What was abolished? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What was against us? The laws which were unto death. If you broke the law, you die. See, when you read Colossians up here, it talks about Christ going to the cross, him dying so that we can live. So that was the ordinances that was against us. The rest of the law wasn't against us. We wanted a law in place so that if we were done wrong or whatever the case is, there was retribution. There was actually some level of judgment and justice. So the law was not wrong, but the part that was against us, if we didn't follow certain things, it meant instant death. So Christ went to the cross to abolish death. Read. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way. And took it out of the way. That was abolished. Read. Nailing it to the cross. Doing what? Nailing it to his cross. So when Christ was nailed to the cross, what was that? Death. He went to the cross so that now, if you join a church like the Church of Corinthians, you don't come into church saying, well, listen, someone just committed adultery. Let's kill these people. Paul was like, well, hold up, brother. We hold up. Let's get the matter. We're not excusing the matter. 
but let's put the matter on the table so that these brothers and sisters will know how to go forward with it so that they can learn from it and be under the grace of Christ because we're not killing people in here. We're not judging people in here. The most high is the judge. And see, and that's the proper context of how the Christian should be teaching these scriptures, not saying that the law is done away with. Okay? Let's go back to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and read, read 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. But their minds were blinded. And whose minds were blinded? Those that were still following the old covenant and not following the new covenant. He's saying their eyes were blinded. Read. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Which veil is done away with Christ. Which means you can look into the heavenly realm or through the spirit of truth through the Holy Spirit if you're following Christ. But if you don't believe in Christ, you have a veil over your eyes. And see, those that don't believe in Christ, you can show them Christ all day long in the Old Testament and they won't believe it because that veil is keeping them from seeing the truth. They don't want the truth, so the Most High put a veil over them. Read. Verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read. Even to this day when Moses is read. The veil is upon their heart. The veil is upon their heart. So you can show brothers who just believe in the Old Testament and don't believe in the New Testament. And they'll sit there and look at you with this blank stare. You take them to Isaiah 53 and say, well, who's that? And they'll be like, well, I don't know, but it can't be Christ. Why? Because they have a veil over them. Read. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Most High, when we when turn, turn to the Lord, to the Most High, uh, the veil shall be taken away. The veil is taken away. And that also pertains to brothers and sisters on either side of the spectrum. If we turn to the truth of the Most High and say, listen, it's time to follow his law, the veil is taken away on the Christian side. When they read the Old Testament, they'll understand it now. Okay? Now, on the other side, for those who don't believe in Christ, when they turn to Christ and understand that in the Old Testament it talks about a lamb coming without blemish that would take away our sins that would allow us to come back to the Father. When we recognize that lamb without blemish, the veil is moved and we can see the truth of Christ. Read. Verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. The, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty, which means he will give you space to get things correct. Okay? That's liberty. That's not an excuse. See, churches use liberty as a law now. Well, it's a law. I can eat pork because I'm under grace. No, that's not a law. You're operating in liberty. Now, you'll get liberty if you're over someone's house and they slip some pork in your greens and you didn't know it. Now that's liberty. Okay? That's not liberty to say, listen, I'm bringing the pork chops to the dinner. Okay? I got this ham working with pineapples on it, and I'm bringing it. I'm, I'm bringing this thing. That's not liberty right there. That's purpose sin. Read. Verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That means it's like looking into a glass, and if you start following Christ and understanding Christ, you become the image you're looking to. It's changing you. The image is changing you. You're becoming what you see. See, but those who believe in the Old Testament, not the New Testament, are not looking at the glass and changing and those that are just dealing with the New Testament and not dealing with the Old Testament are not looking at the glass and changing. You don't have to. All right? So I wanted to go through that scripture on 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3 to give the complete understanding that there is no scriptures in the New Testament that tells us we can break God's law on purpose. 
Now, there's a few places they go, but they, they use these scriptures for the unlearned. It don't work for people who can read the scriptures. Like, they'll say, well, the Most High, what well, Christ says, that which goeth in the belly, that goeth in the mouth, doesn't defile a man, but what proceedeth out of his mouth defiles the man. Hey, but then, you, then when you read the, the chapter it's speaking about, in Matthews, it's talking about the disciples not washing their hands before eating bread. Pork wasn't on the table. So how can you use this scripture to the unlearned and say, well, I can eat anything I want? When pork wasn't on the table and that wasn't the context. And then if they see you know that, they'll try to slip in Cornelius uh, uh, in, in uh, Acts the ninth chapter, Acts the 10th chapter, and say that the Most High had all these beasts come down like on a picnic and told Peter to eat. And he said, eat it three times, that nothing is unclean, nothing is unclean to you. And then you take them down a few verses in the same chapter, Acts 10, and it shows you it's not talking about meat at all. It's talking about people. He was preparing Peter to deal with Cornelius, a Gentile. Crystal clear. So when they see you know, then they'll be like, well, all right. They're deceiving you into breaking God's law on purpose. All right. So. I hope I cleared up the 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. We did Corinthians, Galatians last week, right? Three. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to clear that up. And uh, let me open up the chat so we can answer questions based on that, if you have any particular questions on that. I'm going to unpause the chat here. Okay, the chat is open. Do you have any questions in particular? Did you understand? Uh, the lesson we put out for 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Someone says, uh, okay, okay, Sebastian says, uh, that Christians like to go to show that it's about Christians. Let's go to 1 Peter 4 and 16. First Peter chapter 4, verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify the Most High and on his behalf. Yeah, but... Uh, Sebastian, uh, hold your question for one second so I can answer everything we have here, then I can open it back up. Sebastian, yeah, Christians go there because they see the word Christian there, which means anointed ones. But when it says suffer as a Christian, right here in Peter's, it's, it's talking about pre-Constantine Christians. The Christians today are not Christians, they are pagans. All right, it's a clear difference. Go ahead. Uh, this is uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Go ahead. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And the reason I uh, read this is because you have to understand that this particular epistle wasn't written to, to so-called Christians. It was written to the strangers or Israelites that were scattered abroad. Exactly. Thank you, Lloyd. So when you go to the first chapter and the first verse, it gives you the Christians they were actually, he was actually speaking about. Mm -hmm. These were Israelites that were scattered abroad. All right? It wasn't talking about the, the pagan Christians of today. Okay? Someone asked, uh, is Romans chapter 14 speaking of liberty of food? No, no. They are misinterpreted Romans 14. That's talking about food that's sacrificed to idols. Don't forget, when food was brought, when, when food was purchased from Roman markets or European markets or what you would call Gentile markets, that food was still considered unclean to the Jews 
because that food was sacrificed to idols. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, about getting food from the shambles. An example, just say if you bought a bull from, uh, from a Gentile market. Even though bulls are clean meat or ox is clean meat to the Jews, if someone seen you coming out of their market with that particular cow or calf or bull, they would say that's unclean meat because that's meat that's sacrificed to idols. You see, and the Christians don't know this. That food that's clean in Leviticus 11 was still being called unclean in the New Testament because they were purchasing from the shambles opposed to purchasing from the children of Israel's markets and, and, and farms. So they don't understand this. They, you know, they, they look at it and they see the word unclean and they don't understand that food sacrificed to idols. If, you, if, if, if they were praying a cow or a lamb to Zeus, that meat was unclean to us. So we had liberty under Paul during that time where it says, listen, if we start buying our food from that market, even though it's unclean to other people, we have liberty. But if someone else see us operating and going to get it, let's not be a stumbling block to the unlearned. Don't go there and get that food. Let's buy from our own people. That was the pretext. And I think we did a lesson on that before. Okay, uh, what is the next question here? I can open it up for questions based on the same, on the lines of this lesson. I guess I'll go into uh, the UFO activity at another time. Let me see, what's the next question here? Does the resurrection fight with Christ during the seven year reign? Absolutely. Someone says the scriptures without precepts is that deliberate on the part of the Gentiles to hide some truth from us. Well, there are certain things that the Gentiles just can't link up. But we can go into all the scriptures and every scripture has a precept. There's certain things they don't understand. They're just linking up things that they can link up through their Christian understanding. You understand? So it's not purpose with them doing that. It's just that they can only link up things based on the Christian doctrine. Uh, uh, that is correct, Verge. She says, uh, the word repent is a New Testament work, correct? If there's no law, what need is there for anyone to repent? Common sense. Repent from what? The law is done away with. Uh, yes, you are correct there. Let's see here. Someone says... Why do people use Romans 10 and 4 to say the law is done away with? Let's go to Romans 10 and 4. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 4. Read it. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's crystal clear. That links directly into what we said before. It says the end of the law. All right. That's not talking about all the laws. So now, when you go into the first, go to the first verse. Uh, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to the Most High for Israel. For who? For Israel. For who? For Israel. Read. Is that they might be saved. That they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of the Most High, but not according to knowledge. So the, our people, Israel, want to follow the Most High, but they don't have the knowledge to do it. So this is still talking about Israel here. They got a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Read. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of the Most High's righteousness. Because they are ignorant to the Most High's righteousness. Hold up now. Oh, oh. Let's get what the Most High's righteousness is. 
because they are ignorant of the Most High's righteousness. Read. And going about to establish their own righteousness. And they went about to establish their own righteousness. Read. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of the Most High. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of the Most High. So the question is, what is the righteousness of the Most High? What is the righteousness of the Most High? Okay. Let's go to Psalms 119 and 142. Psalms chapter 119 verse 142. Read it. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. So they went about to establish their own righteousness because they're ignorant of the Most High's righteousness, correct? Psalms 119 and 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Read. And thy law is the truth. Is what? And thy law is the truth. The law is the righteousness, brothers and sisters. And thy law is the truth. So when it says that Christ is the end of the law, and let's go back to in, in Corinthians 10 and 4. Read that. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 10 verse 4. Romans 10 4, excuse me. For Christ is the end of the law. So when it says Christ is the end of the law, you have to understand what law it's talking about. Him being placed on the cross. The law of sacrifice. Read. For righteousness to every one that believeth. For everyone that believeth. Now, if you believe, you already know you can't break God's law on purpose. If you are a believer. The question is, was Paul breaking God's law? The answer to that is absolutely no. Was Peter breaking God's law? Absolutely no. So these are the scriptures they use in error, purpose error, to teach lies. Okay, let's see the next one here. Let me get us a better camera here. We'll have one soon. Okay, what's the next one before we break down here? Let's see what else we have. This camera it sucks. All right, one moment. Someone asked, if Canadians was a Gentile, why are the Israelites saying he was really an Israelite? Well, the Israelites are saying that Canadians was, uh, 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 was an Israelite because they cannot get around the fact that the Most High actually accepted an Edomite. Because their doctrine solely lays on talking and attacking white people, Cornelius used to be a, uh, a bump in the road for them. Don't forget, I was there when they first came out with this Cornelius was an Israelite thing. And when Gentiles and other people used to come up to the speaking and say, well, what about Cornelius? There was no answer for them. So they just figured, well, what would you say he's an Israelite? All right? Cornelius was an Edomite. And if you don't believe that, you can read Acts 15 and 14 and link that to Joel 2, 9 through 11. And that makes it crystal clear. Hmm? Yeah, Amos 9 and 11. Excuse me, Amos 9 and 11. Acts 15 and 14, Amos 9 and 11. There's no scripture anywhere that say that, that, say that Cornelius was an Israelite. Okay? That's utterly ridiculous. Someone asks, why is it against the law for men to be bald? Or to make baldness in... Well, the Most High didn't say in particular why he says don't make baldness. 
in our head. So I can't assume why. If I run into something that shows that, then I'll, I'll go forward with it. But there's nothing in the scripture where the Most High say in particular why he says a man is not to make baldness in his head. The letter J does not come from King James. All right. That was the letter that was created. Did it come before or after King James? When you look, when you look at the King James translation, there is no J's within the translation. So they would, that, that would lend us to understand that it must have came afterwards. Mm -hmm. What else we have here? Let's go through these questions before we pray out here. Uh, when it comes to John Hycranus and his part, y'all would have to, that's a lesson in itself. We can't even do a, an overview on that. That's a lot of time. Someone says that according to another scripture in what, Corinthians or something? Where is that at? They say that baptism is not a necessity. When someone claims that something is not a necessity that Christ said is a necessity, we're not even open for, uh, that's not open for debate. If Christ says that you, want, you, you cannot get into the kingdom of heaven unless you be baptized, in St. John, the third chapter, that should be the end of any debate when it comes to baptism. Paul did not come to undo what Christ did. When brothers and sisters came to Paul, when he was in their presence and said they were ready for baptism, he gave them water. He showed them water. Someone asked me about uh, hurricanes, and one of the brothers, uh, Nathaniel Alaba, sent me something that was key based on hurricanes, and I'm going to share that before we pray out. He was asking, is it possible, is it possible that the harp system and the use of the heart system, which we know is fallen angel technology given to Nick Tesla, was, was any of those things spoken of in the Old Testament based on some research he did? All praises to be to the Most High. So he, came, he showed me something, and I, I think I need to share this, because it, it kind of blew me away. Hold on here. One moment here. One moment here. You see this? Say something about hurricane. One moment. No, he. One moment. Isn't it, isn't that thing y'all on right now? If he's on, type in there if you're on, Nathaniel. Okay.
Yeah. One moment, let me see if I can find it. One moment. Okay, when I get it, I'll share it. I don't feel like putting too much time in that. Uh, Elder Kabar is going to come on soon. When I get it, I'm going to show it, but he showed a word in the Hebrew that means to control a cloud in the Old Testament. And I'm going to show you that that technology is actually in Scripture. He brought that to our attention. To be able to control a cloud or to make storms is part of uh, a word. It's like a sorcery word or enchantment word. I think it was enchantment. Let me see here. One moment. Let me check here. That's good. I think I can get it. I think that's it. One moment. I think that's it. Yeah, if he get that, tell him to give it to me. No, it's not that one. I'll find it, though. Once he give it to me, but he sent it to me, and, and I looked into it, and it was correct. To be able to control a cloud is part of the sorcery that the angels gave gave mankind but they had to use uh, the resources within the earth to actually do what sometimes comes natural when the spirits form clouds so they taught mankind how to do these things within the earth but that's a lesson all in itself and I guess we'll we'll include that with the lessons of the uh, the spirits uh, these angelic activities you see, these fallen angel activities you see with UFOs right now. Someone say the word is sorcery. Let's see. Let me check that. You said sorcery, right? I wasn't going to go into that, but it was in my mind, so I thought I would just mention it. Because there's no end. Wait a sec. How do you use this particular one here? Oh, here it is. You're used to this one, I'm not. No, that's not it either, is it? No, I'll get it. Uh, let me see. Is it? <laughs> yeah. When you look at the word, when you look at the word sorcery in the Greek, 3096 in your Strong's Concordance, it says, that is, Oriental scientist, a scientist. So people that mix potions and your chemists and scientists, they were known as sorcerers in old time. Let's see here, but I'll get it though. I, I, I'll get the one I've been looking for. Huh? 
Yeah, Pharma Key links into it, yeah. Okay, Adawam says it's enchanters. Enchanters, let me get enchanters. The water, that's it, I think that's it. Enchanters. Enchanters. Let's see. Yeah. And that's something it says. Enchanters, which is 6049 means to cover, to cloud over. Let me see here. And when you, the word it's taken from is 6049 Amon, which means as covering the sky, that is, the nimbus or thundercloud, or cloud. So enchanters would learn or have the technology to make thunder clouds and clouds in the sky. These are what the scriptures call enchanters. They were your harp system. It's sorcery. You got it? So, someone says um, you're in college and you play uh, for a team. Is it okay to play and practice? Well, listen, the Lord did give us grace, all right? So you follow the Sabbath in your heart and you continue to do what you're doing. You understand? But, but, but do what you're doing. You do have grace in some instances. Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. You know, and, but when you can have a day off on the Sabbath, take it. Who are the Indians in India? Well, the majority of the Indians in, in India, a lot of them are which what, what a lot of them are Asians, which are Japheth. You have a lot of them who are Israel, who went into those areas. Okay, we got to pray out, and uh, in about a couple of minutes, Elder Gabar will come in for the law class, okay? We went a little over his time. He's going to come in, and he'll be able to continue the class in the law. We're going to say shalom. Again, uh, there is a few, a few seats we have left for the uh, enhanced 